Good morning. So appreciative of the wraparound ministry here at Westside and those of you who are participating in that. And uh, for instance, uh, just the other day, Amanda and our wraparound ministry threw a baby shower uh, for some new parents. That's just one of the little ways um, that you can help support. It doesn't mean that you have to carry the load for an entire family yourself. The more of us that sign up, the lighter the load and the more families we can surround. But I did hear one statistic there that was astounding, 65 foster families among 250 churches. Is that about what you said, something like that? Uh, We can do better than that. Uh, Among our churches, uh, how can we uh, minister to these children? As they said so well, didn't choose this. Uh, But we're part of a community, a community that needs to love its neighbor. And who needs love more than these children? And the opportunity to see life closer to what it's meant to be lived like. And as we study this community in Exodus, the community that God's designing for them to, you'll see that mercy and justice, and caring for one another is, is, is not a law, it is, it is the character of God himself. And so the laws reflect his character. They also reflect joy, what we can, how we can have the kind of life that truly brings us joy, but brings our community joy, and brings children like this joy, is if we follow the character of God. And maybe, maybe God would just put it on your heart to do one part. Really head to that table afterwards. Call Amanda or my wife Sarah. Talk to them about how you can be involved. Uh, there are all kinds of ways Uh, including being a foster parent. So let me take just a moment and pray for them as well. Can we pray? Father, we just place this into your hands. But God, you turn around and you place it into ours. And you look at us and you say, I've given you the resources, I've given you the homes, and I've given you the responsibility. And God, you're calling on us to use wisdom and discernment and and how we can care for our community, the least of these, the voiceless. And so God, call each of us to a place of service in ways that are meaningful, in ways that are uh, walking in your footsteps, walking in your love. God, even speak to us through Exodus 20, through the Ten Commandments, may we see your heart for justice, your heart for mercy, even in your law. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Well, take your Bibles if you would, and we're going to, uh, I'm going to teach through five chapters of the Bible. Say amen. I'm going to do it in 30 minutes. <laughs> five chapters of the Bible, and the reason is, is that I'm going, to sh- I'm going to show you how to study it, and then encourage you to walk through it on your own, because what we have in Exodus 20 through 24 is we have 10 general principles of how to live life. We call them the 10 what? They're 10 words. They're 10 statements. They're 10 characteristics, really, of a divine community. And then what we see in chapters 21 through 24 are applications of those 10 principles to everyday life. How many of you own an ox? Anybody own an ox? So, one application is what happens if your ox gores your neighbor, right? That probably won't happen today, but you have a particular problem that the same principle that God applies to what you do when your ox kills your neighbor will apply to something that happens in your life. So, God is going to give us wisdom through these 10 principles, and these 10 principles uh, continue to live in the lives of of new covenant believers because they are principles connected really to the heart of God himself. Aren't you tired of watching riots? Aren't you tired of watching wars and violence and the things of political intrigue? We all are weary of this. If you could, would you start a new world? Well, God is pretty tired of it too. And so he said, I'm going to choose a people, 
out of this world. I'm going to choose a people because they're not going to choose me. I'm going to choose a people. I'm going to pull them out, and I am going to, I'm going to call them to a life of faith, and then I'm going to rescue these people, and I am going to give them laws and principles of how to live so that this new community can be seen by the rest of the world, and the rest of the world can go, oh, that's how our Creator wants us to live. And so he called Israel. He said, I'm going to, I've chosen you and called you out to be a kingdom of priests to represent God to the people and the people to God and a holy nation so that when they look at the way you live and the way you handle one another's lives and the way you love your neighbor and the way you treat God, when they look at you, they'll see this is the way life is meant to be lived. And so what we have in this nation of Israel is a a special people, a prized possession but they're treasured and blessed by God to turn around and be a blessing to others. You say, well, I'm not part of this old covenant people. Well, you kind of are. You are grafted in through the new covenant, a new covenant in the blood of Christ. And by the way, we're going to conclude today with the Lord's Supper. And I think you'll see that it flows beautifully towards this Um, But what we're going to talk about is law this morning. And and in Exodus chapter 20, we have the Ten Commandments. But notice what he says, verse verse 1. And God spoke all these words. So God is speaking. When God speaks, things happen. And here's what he said. I am the Lord, your God. I brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. I have redeemed you, and I have rescued you because I'm going to have a do-over. I'm going I'm to create a new creation, a new people to be priests to the world and a blessing to the world and, and, to, and to be a, 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 a YouTube video for the whole world to say, oh, this is how life is to be lived. Anybody check YouTube before you fix something? Everybody's got a video on how to fix everything. I love it now. It's how to change your plumbing, how to cook. I mean, I don't cook anything without checking YouTube, right? And they, so this is an audio-visual demonstration of life with God. And that's what he wants us to see. But he had to teach them to live because for 430 years they'd been in a different culture, in a different system, under slavery. And they had, a lot of the ways of life had just been compromised. And so when they were set free, I think it's interesting, he didn't just set them free and he said, go out and live life, you're free. He said, no, freedom really never exists if you are not confined by the love of God and the love of your neighbor. Let me just give you an answer. So we called this whole thing the Wilderness University. And so maybe you felt like when you, gradu- when you graduated high school and you were going to college, some of you may, may have gone, I am free. I'm liberated from these slave drivers my parents were. I will never clean my room again. The only problem is, is you, you had a roommate. Did the roommate appreciate you not cleaning your room? Or better yet, maybe you were the clean freak and you got in there and you found yourself enslaved and imprisoned with someone who didn't understand the law. (laughs) And so you had to come up with some ground rules. I mean, I've had, I had several roommates during college, and, and they were all different. Some were neat freaks, and some were messy. And then you know what happens if a group of guys or a group of girls, they get in there, and they start living in a, in a condominium or something, and then it's, it's my time or your time to buy toilet paper, and you don't do it. <laughs> your roommate may put up with that one month and actually buy some extra toilet paper, but they're not going to do it the next month. And by the third month, everybody's looking at each other, we're, not, we're never going to have toilet paper again because I'm not buying it. I'm not, it's unjust. There's no justice that I am the one that always cleans the dishes. We're going to have a sit-down meeting here, roommates, and I'm going to tell you I'm tired of cleaning the dishes all the time. You leave your messy dishes around. How many of you have had those conversations with a roommate? Your husband right? 
your wife, your kids. You were free from home only to find yourself enslaved to the expectations of the society and the people among whom you live. And not only that, when you go to university, they expect you to go to class. They expect you to take exams. They expect you to learn. You're not really free because you serve a higher authority. And so our world has this crazy idea that freedom comes when you have no authority, when you have no guidelines. It couldn't be further from the truth. True freedoms comes in having the correct authority and the correct guidelines and living in joyful submission to them together. That's where true liberty and true joy happens. Libertarians, eventually, true libertarians turn into chaos. There's got to be some type, and I'm not talking about politically, I'm talking about, in your, well, I am talking about politically, but just in your own lives. You know what you, know what you are if you get rid of all uh, authority and all people, <laughs> you're alone. And, you, and even the electricity you're using requires what? People. There are people running the electricity. So God brings them together and he has this, he says, listen, I, I've set you free, but you've got to learn how to live together. And not only do you have to learn to live with other people, he says first and foremost, and far more importantly, you've got to learn to live in right relationship with me. Notice the progression of the Ten Commandments. The progression of the Ten Commandments. It starts with God and then moves to people. Now, why does, why does he do that? Well, he wants us to have a, a community that the world is envious of, that the world looks at and goes, how do they do that? It will be a community, first of all, marked by joy. You know, because joy comes when you're living in right relationship vertically with God and in right relationship horizontally with others. Isn't that a beautiful combination when it happens? You have peace with God and peace with others. Love for God and love from God and love with others and for others and from others. Man, that is that's the society everybody wants. They just don't know how to get it. And God says, I am going to show you how to have this joyful, joyful community. I, you're my treasured possession, he says in Exodus 19.5. The first thing that you need to know is that I want to treasure you and I want you to treasure me. And when you treasure something, you want to know what they want, right? So when I called my wife and I, I gave her a ring and I made a vow and I said to her, basically, you are my treasured possession. Of all the other people in the world, you are my treasured possession. And then we moved in together and started living together and I quickly realized for me to remain her treasured possession, there were some rules I needed to follow and vice versa, right? So we treasure each other, but it isn't just a, an emotional thing. It is a practical life that we have to live together. So God says, I treasure you, and you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And here's what it looks like. And he begins to give the Ten Commandments. And so we treasure God, and he treasures us. And as we do that, we become a blessing, a blessing to the world around us. And God basically says, if you're going to be my roommate, Israel, these are the ground rules. If you want to live with me in community, this is what it looks like. And then he says, if you want to live together in a divine, priestly, holy community, if you want to live in that kind of community, here are the kind of things 
that it will be characterized by and the kind of commands that you will need to follow. I love what he says in Deuteronomy 5, 29. God, you just hear him. You just hear his heart. He says, oh, that they would always have hearts like this because they just said, yes, God, we're going to live this way. We're going to live this way. We agree. We agree. And, and he goes, oh, I, I wish that they would always have hearts like this, that they might fear me and obey all my commands. If they did, they and their descendants would have a community of joy and prosper forever. How did they do? Not so well. Not so well. Christ wants us to be his community of joy. And Christ gives in his Sermon on the Mount another a deeper edition of the law for us. And he says, here's how you are to relate with God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And through these two commandments, you cover all those commandments. Isn't it, isn't it kind of cool that you could, if you could just obey the first one, it would take care of the second one. If you could just obey the first one and it took care of the second one, it would take care of 631 regulations that the Israelites eventually came up with. So he says, if you're going to live in my kingdom, here are the ground rules for joy. Joy. Think of it that way. Everybody loves Disney World. If you go to Disney World, if you go to Disney World, well, I used to love to go to Disney World. But if you go, it's just so much better than other theme parks. And you know why? Listen to what, it's the guy who invented it. He said, whatever, this is Walt Disney. This is what he said. He said, this is how we're going to be a unique community, a people, a park the whole world's going to want to go to. Whatever you do, do it well. Do it so well that when people see you do it, they will want to come back and see you do it again. And they will want to bring others and show them how well you do what you do. And I think God is saying, if you'll live in this kind of relationship vertically with me and horizontally with others, the world's going to going to look at that. They're going to see that. Guests in Walt Disney World are never more than 30 steps away from a trash can because according to uh, 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 tradition, uh, Walt Disney would linger in the parks and he would count the steps of someone that had just unwrapped. He'd count how many steps it was before they dropped a piece of trash on the ground. And so he just made a rule. There's going to be a, there's going to be a trash can no more than 30 steps away from any person at any point. Listen, if we will collect our, uh, our sin and we'll cover, uh, we'll, we'll live in right relationship with God and others, it will keep a clean, holy, beautiful community of joy. But to have a community of joy, here's what the law tells us. It has to be a community of justice. Justice. What do we mean by that? Well, let's look at the Ten Commandments for a second. In these Ten Commandments, and I'm not preaching on the Ten Commandments, I'm telling you how to read and think about the Ten Commandments today. I'm just encouraging you. I want you to see the first, the first side. There's two plates, basically, one with five, the other side with five. The first plate talks about how to treat God justly, just as he deserves. It is unjust to treat God like he's one among another, among any other gods. That is totally unjust treatment of God. It is so unjust to take your hands and form something out of gold or silver or dirt or clay and bow to it and worship that graven image as if it were God. What an insult. What an injustice to the creator of all space, time, and matter. So he gives a command. He says, listen, that's unjust treatment of the one whole, holy, and true God. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, verse 4 says. Verse 5 says, you shall not bow down to them or serve them, for the Lord your God... Uh, 
For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, why is God doing this? Remember, ultimately, you are his treasured possession. He wants it to be a community marked by joy, but it can't be a community of of joy if there are people who are in wrong relationship with the one true God who are worshiping false idols or who have made things in their lives more important than God. That is injustice. In verse 7, he said, Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. It's not talking about cursing. That's a bad thing even on its own or saying using God's name in vain. What does that mean? It means that you do something and, and you attribute it to God or you take the name of Christ on your life and you live in such a way that you bring shame onto the name of Christ. I think that's one of the things that really, really is, 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 is one of the worst things to see is people who take the name of Christ and live, do not live like Christ. Live unchristlike lives. It's like just take the name off. Live however you want. Just don't take the name of Christ and live that way. That is taking the name of God in vain. That's unjust treatment of his glorious name. To be in right relationship with him, we have to be, treat his name and the relationship we have with him with the kind of honor and respect that it deserves. Amen? He's worthy. And so we, to treat him justly, we take a day He asks for a day because he is creator. He tells the people of Israel, because I created this world in six days and I rested. I want you every week as you're working in the fields and you're trying to provide for the food in your mouth and in your family and all of these things, I want you to stop and give me a day and recognize I am the creator of the universe. I have rested from this and I will take care of you as an act of faith. So if someone is out there working on the Sabbath, these Israelites are working on the Sabbath, it was basically saying God is not a good creator. God can't take care of my needs. I don't trust him or believe him. And that's unjust treatment or unjust treatment of God, isn't it? And so he says, take that day, give me a day. But then there's another one here. It's not just the just treatment of God, there's the just treatment of parents. This, in a sense, stands alone. Look at verse 12. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long as the hand, as the land of the Lord your God is given you. Long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. It's interesting, isn't it? that parents, this law is on the vertical side of the Ten Commandments. The vertical side, but, but they're also kind of on the horizontal. We live horizontal lives with our parents, but he has them on the vertical tablet. Why is that? Because parents have a unique place in our lives. They are co-creators with God. And therefore deserve your respect and honor. You say, well, you just hadn't met my parents. No parent is perfect. But God is saying, when you honor your parents, you are recognizing this divine image that I've, I've given you uh, uh, partnership in this creative work. I, I, I commanded you to be fruitful and multiply And so we honor the position, even when the person doesn't always act honorable. It's interesting, it doesn't say love them. It doesn't even say like them. Now, we we should love our parents, like our parents. 
But ultimately, we're honoring that this is part of God's vertical, because who, who did God place in authority over you vertically? Your parents. And so we honor that as God's way. And so I'm telling you, one of the reasons our society is crumbling is because kids rule the house. Parents and authority and the authority of parents has been thrown out the window. And a lot of that is because parents no longer understand their role and are in not in right relationship with God themselves and so have nothing to contribute to the lives spiritually and in wisdom to, and so we just see the breakdown of the home and, and part of this foster issue that we have is just the breakdown of this structure of our society and what a beautiful thing it is for a family to take a, a child who has been uh, dishonorably left out of their own home to take them in and step in place vertically and horizontally to step into the life of this child and provide a vertical connection to the one true God into the life of this child. And then a horizontal life and show them how to live in a Christian home. What an incredible incredible and honorable thing it is. And so you honor your foster parents. You honor your adopted parents. You honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land. That's a whole nother sermon, but I think we need to treat our parents justly. And thirdly, the second half, we treat others justly. How do we do that? Well, we don't take what doesn't belong to us. And the first thing we would never take is their lives. People have a right to personhood and have a right to life. And we do not murder. That life was granted by God. And there are only few circumstances where someone forfeits their right to continue living and there are times when people forfeit that and they lose their lives. There is the just taking of life, but we do not murder. Uh, that is the killing of the innocent. We do not take what doesn't belong to us in marriage. You shall not commit adultery. You don't take another person's spouse. That's unjust you do not take their property. In verse 15, that is not how a joyful society lives. It is unjust. People have a right to earn and possess property. We do not have the right to take what they own, right? It's unjust. We can give, we can share, but we don't take what doesn't belong to us. Can you imagine? This sounds like a great society to me. You shall not bear false witness. What do you take when you bear false witness? You take their reputation. Do not steal someone else's reputation through gossip and slander or false witness. And where does a lot of this, where's a lot of that kind of taking Born, it's born in the heart. And look at verse 17. Don't covet. Don't covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything else that is your neighbor's. You trust God to bring into your life what you need. Don't take what doesn't belong to you. That's how we justly treat others. Now, in chapter 21 through 24, what we have are case law. We have case cases. And I think it's interesting that God wrote this case law. God's thinking, here's, here's, how, 
he says, all right, I want to, I've given them the 10 principles. If they'll just do this, if they'll live in right relationship with me and right relationship with others, with these principles, it will be a society marked by joy and a society and community marked by justice. But you know us. How many rolls of toilet paper should I have to buy? Did you include uh, cleaning the kitchen when you meant cleaning the kitchen? Does that mean vacuuming as well? You know, we just, we want specifics. How do we apply do not steal to our college roommates? Well, one of the things is, it's like, my first college roommate used to steal my sleep. <laughs> he couldn't sleep, and so he would play music, and his music was so loud in his, in his headphones that I could hear it, and I couldn't sleep. And so we had to have a discussion about, I need sleep. I feel like I, 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 I'm, you owe me a few hours of sleep every night. It's unjust, so we, we got to think about how are we stealing from our spouse? Are you stealing the kind of love, the kind of kind words that they deserve? Are you a thief in your own home? How do we apply these principles? So we have to take the principles and apply them to our everyday life. And the, ca the case studies in these four chapters, you can just read through them, are rather interesting. A lot of them you're gonna struggle with because uh, we don't have indentured servitude. We don't have, a lot of us don't farm. We don't have farm animals. Uh, we don't have cities of refuge. Some of these things are hard for us, but I think you can see. What, what God does is he says, I'm gonna give you a lot of examples and you study the examples over and over again until it becomes automatic. Automatic. The idea, I think, of the case law in chapter 21 and 24 is to reduce the number of court cases that have to go to court. Because actually, this is what I think Paul says to us as the church. Why are you taking each other to court, public, secular court, when I've given you the principles in order to have the wisdom and discernment to decide it within the body of Christ? And so I think, I think God is saying, I'll give you my law, then I'll give you lots of examples so that you don't have to take it to court. You just know that if your ox kills your neighbor's donkey, you owe your neighbor what? A donkey. You don't need anybody to tell you that. You go and you apologize and you replace the donkey. And if you don't have another donkey, it says this. It says, you come up with the cash equivalent of a donkey, right? Simple case laws. The problem is, is in, in our world, we, we, we tend to have to be told and made to do these things. But in a, in a Christ-like society, we, we know the law is written on our hearts and we know we know not to do these things, and we know what happens when this happens. And we're honest because it's in our hearts, to be honest. It's not because we're fearing we're going to be caught. That's the, that's the world's way of working. We, we want to be in right relationship with God, and if so, we will be right in right relationship with our neighbors. So in Exodus 21, verse 12, he says this about murder. Whoever strikes a man so that he dies, that's premeditated. He's striking so that he will die. That's murder. What's the penalty? Death. He, it's, it's tooth for tooth. It's life for life. You premeditatedly decided to take this person's life unlawfully, and so you forfeit your life. Now in verse 18... Two guys get in a fight, and they're not planning to kill each other. They just get in a fight. One strikes another with a stone and with his fist, and the man does not die but takes to his bed. He's hurt. But if the man gets better, rises again, walks outdoors with his staff, he who struck him is not going to have to be killed. That wouldn't be fair. That wouldn't be just to take his life because his friend got better. Only he shall pay for the loss of his time. This guy wasn't able to work. 
while he was beat up. And so you're responsible to cover his wages during that time that you hit him with a rock and put him in his bed. Does that make sense? Man, if we lived like this, it'd empty the courts out. He says, uh, only he shall pay for the loss of his time and shall have him thoroughly healed. You pay and make sure that his doctor bills are covered. I find this very interesting in reference to the sanctity of life. Look at verse 22. When men strive together and hit a pregnant woman. So the idea is these two guys are in a fight and, want, and the wife of one of them tries to get in between them and break up this fight. And they accidentally hit her. She's knocked over or whatever. It says, so that her children come out. And that word come out means they're born. They come out early. They're premature or whatever. But, but there is no harm. The one who hit her shall surely be fined as the woman's husband shall impose on him. But you know that guy's going to be really, really mad because you just knocked my wife over and the babies came out. Everybody's okay, but I can impose a fine. But you know he's going to be mad. And so, but in a just society, he, they add this to it, and its owner, it, 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 it says... Um, uh, it'll be fine, but it says the, he shall pay as the judges determined. They know even at that point a judge needs to come in because of the emotional um, part of this to make sure that the fine is not excessive. But look at this. But if there is harm, you shall pay life for life. Isn't that fascinating? And there's a lot of debate on this, but I believe that it's clearly stating if those babies are born or that baby is born dead and you're responsible for the death of that child, that child is not just a fetus. That child is a life. And it's a life for a life. Life is, the, is really the greatest thing we have. We cannot take it. We cannot take it. Then there's stipulations about negligence, the possession of property, property and all of this. But I have to close I think what God is trying to, to develop is saying, if you will live in right relationship with me vertically, and here's some principles of that, five principles. Honor parents, take a day, don't take my name in vain, no graven images. I'm the one and only true God in your life. And then if you live horizontally with your neighbors correctly, you're going to be a joyful society. And you will be a just community. But there's only one problem. They couldn't do it. And we still fight with our roommates. And we still fuss over who's going to wash the dishes. And we're still having divorces. And there's adultery in the churches. And there's thievery. We're still broken, aren't we? We can't live this way. So God needed another do-over. He had to create a, another new people with a new covenant. And this new covenant, it had to be started with someone unlike Adam, unlike Abraham, like Moses, it had to be started with someone unbreakable who was without sin. And then it had to be a family we could join some way other than physical birth. We had to be able to join by faith. And listen to what Galatians says. 
Galatians says in chapter 4, verse 4, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. How did he do that? Well, Colossians says, you who were dead in the trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. He set it aside. Your guilt, he set your guilt aside. But that, if I just said that, it would be, it could give us the wrong impression. We owe for a lot of cleaning. We've created a lot of dirt. We've not paid for a lot of bills spiritually. And the wages of that sin is what? Death. God can't just come down and look at all of the debt I've incurred through all the sin of my life and just set it aside. That's not how he did it. And that's not how this verse ends. He didn't just say, oh, I'm overlooking it. I'll buy all the toilet paper. I'll take care of all the problems. That's not what he did. That is not the gospel. Because that debt, here's what he did. He took it and he nailed it to the what? The cross. He nailed our debt to the cross. He canceled the record of that debt by placing it on Christ. Christ fulfilled and kept the perfect law He was the perfect Israelite, the perfect Jew, the perfect human being. He was the God in the flesh, and then he took our guilt to the cross. And there, he nailed it. And through that, we can receive forgiveness of sin. And we are put in right relationship with God. And he enables us to live in right relationship with each other. If it weren't for Jesus, none of us could be roommates with God. We could never room with God. But because of Jesus, we can room with him forever. Would you pray with me? We're going to take the Lord's Supper and we pass one cup that's, that's two cups attached together. So be sure you take both cups. They're attached together. And it is, in it is a symbol of his body and a symbol of his blood. But it's a new covenant. And before we pass this out, just spend a few moments in prayer in confession and thanksgiving that in Christ he's created a new people and you get to be a part of it. Thank you that even though we could not live this law in its perfection. Thank you that Jesus fulfilled every jot and tittle. He lived it fully and completely on our behalf. And then thank you that he took our guilt to the cross. And then he put in us a new person. He put in us new spirits, new hearts. And now with the Holy Spirit in us, Father, We can live in this kind of joyful, just community as the the church, as the kingdom of God. Thank you for making this available in Christ. And so now we pass the cup, God, and we pass the bread, and we take it together, signifying that we are one nation, one people from all languages and tribes and tongues We're one people under God through Jesus. We thank you. In his name we pray. Amen.